is one of our marine biologists, Catherine. Hi, Catherine. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Heidi. How's it going? Excellent. Now, as you can see, Catherine is wearing a very special full face mask, and that mask allows her to be able to breathe, talk, and hear us all from underwater. Now, Catherine, what is it that you do here at the Seattle Aquarium? Uh, well, I am really lucky because I get to take care of all the inverts here at the aquarium, including one of my very favorite inverts. Now, an invert, which is also known as an invertebrate, those are the animals without backbones. And, of course, Catherine, you want to introduce us to our, the star of our hour today? Absolutely. Let me introduce you to our 40-pound female giant Pacific octopus named Umi, which is spelled U-M-I. And that is the Japanese word for sea. And this is the world's largest species of octopus. They can get up to 100 and 50 pounds. Now, the sea, that is exactly where giant Pacific octopus are found. And as a matter of fact, they can be found in the Sea of Japan, but they're also found along the coastline, the Pacific coastline, from Alaska all the way down to Central California. And here in Seattle, we are so lucky that we have them living in our local waters right outside of the aquarium. Now, uh, speaking of those local waters, Catherine, what is the underwater weather report today? Oh, well, it is 46 degrees, which is a little bit cold. So I am wearing a very special suit called a dry suit. That dry suit keeps me dry from head to toe and keeps me nice and toasty warm because uh, humans aren't designed to live in this kind of water. Absolutely not. Catherine needs to wear that special suit so she can go exploring in the underwater environment to be able to admire and see amazing animals like our giant Pacific octopus here. Now, uh, because we're not designed to live in the ocean, there are, or not because, but there are many animals that are designed to live in the ocean, like our octopus, and each of them have unique characteristics and adaptations that, that help them to survive in their habitat. Now, a habitat is their home. And as you look around this rocky habitat, uh, Umi's rocky habitat, her home here at the aquarium, this gives you a sneak peek into what it's like right outside in our Northwest, Pacific Northwest waters. Now, uh, we can see that Umi is starting to move around and she's showing off some color changes. And that is one of her adaptations. Octopus have many adaptations that help them to survive. Catherine, what are a couple of your favorites? Ah, well, one of my favorites is their ability to change their color and their texture. And as you can see, Umi right now is this bright red color. And she also has the ability to go completely white using cells called chromatophores. The other cool thing that she can do is change her texture. So she can go from this bumpy texture you see right now to completely smooth using her muscles to smooth out her skin. That's right. Now, that is a perfect example of why I often refer to octopus as magicians of the ocean. Their ability to disappear right before your very eyes. Now, octopus uh, are like magicians. Octopus have more than one way that they disappear. Other times, they may actually squish and squeeze their bodies through teeny tiny spaces. And it'll be uh, hard to believe how and how small of a space a 40 pound octopus can squeeze through. Now, we know that a 50 pound giant Pacific octopus can fit through a space that's about two inches wide. So Umi here at 40 pounds, she could very easily fit through a hole this small. Now, uh, octopus have a pretty amazing and unusual anatomy, and let's talk a little bit about that anatomy that we're seeing right here. I know. So one of the cool things is this big sack right here is her mantle, and these guys are actually called cephalopods, which means head, foot. So if you try and imagine taking your head off and switching it with your body, you would be just like an octopus. Now, uh, as we're looking at Umi here, 
Catherine mentioned this big bubble, that mantle. And what exactly is a mantle? Uh, well, the mantle is basically the area where all of her organs are kept. So inside this mantle here is her stomach, her three hearts, and her gills. And if you look closely, you'll be able to see her breathe through an opening in her mantle where she will draw water in over her gills and then back out through her siphon on the side of her body. Now, those gills are important for her to survive in the underwater environment. And much like a fish, those gills act like a sponge. And instead of or absorbing water, they're absorbing oxygen from the water. But those gills aren't the only thing that octopus need to survive. One of something that's really important are all eight of those wiggly octopus arms. <laughs> and we got a chance to see her gripping on to things in her environment. We can see her actually gripping onto you. What what exactly is happening when she is touching you, Catherine? Oh well those suction cups are actually really cool. Not only do they allow her to grab onto things, but they're her taste buds. So everything that she touches, she is tasting. Now, imagine if you were an octopus and you could taste everything you walked on, everything you touched, everything in your entire environment. That is what it's like for them. Now, most of us have no desire to taste the inside of our shoes or anything that we touch for that matter. But for their lifestyle, it is key in their survival. They need to be able to taste when there are predators nearby that they need to hide from, but also if there is prey nearby that they need to eat. And uh, exactly where do they put all that food? Ah, uh, well, one of their absolute favorite food items is crab. They love crab. So they're going to crawl along the bottom, find a crab using those sucker discs. They're going to grab onto that crab, and they're going to pull it to the very center of all of their arms. Inside the center of all those arms is their mouth. Inside their mouth is their one hard part of their body, which is called their beak. Now, that beak is the only hard part in their body, and uh, that beak is what helps to determine how small of a space that they can actually fit through. So, if their beak is this big around, that's how small of a space they can go through. Now, uh, when, you, when she mentioned that a uh, giant Pacific octopus really likes to eat crab, it's easy to imagine how those big claws could actually bite right through a giant Pacific octopus. So they need another adaptation to be able to survive that experience and to be able to eat that crab. So what, what else happens, Catherine? That's right. Well, they actually have a venom inside that mouth of theirs that they can release into the water and that is going to paralyze their food so that crab that they've just caught cannot pinch her. Now, if their venom is designed to paralyze their prey, uh, does that make you a little nervous about scuba diving with octopus? Are you uh, afraid of getting bitten? <laughs> absolutely not. These guys are incredibly friendly and curious animals. They can taste me with those sucker discs again, and Umi here knows that I am not food, that I am just somebody to interact with and to play with. And that just uh, ties right into their level of curiosity about what is going on in their environment. It's not just about what they need to hide from. It's about knowing what is going on around you. Now, on that note, uh, I that is a perfect example of why giant Pacific octopus are my personal favorite animal on this entire planet. And I hope today they are yours as well. And I think that it's time we should go to the question and answer session with our students. Are you ready, Catherine? Absolutely. It looks like way. Amy's ready. And first, we are going to Mrs. Andre's class. Make sure to unmute your microphone before you start talking. Uh, Alex. Does an octopus have a, make a good pet? All right, so I'm going to have Mrs. Andre's class speak. Make sure that you're speaking very loud into the microphone so that I can hear you really well. Can I come up there? Alex, what is your question? 
does an octopus make a good pet? Oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, does an octopus make a good pet, Catherine? Uh, actually, no, they do not. They don't make very good pets for your home because they are extremely hard to take care of because you need to create this environment for them. So they are best left out in the sea. That's right. They live in the cold, salty ocean water, and that can often be a challenge to recreate in a home uh, aquarium, much like the people might need to use a heater to heat up water for tropical fish. Now, another thing is that octopus also happen to be escape artists, again, just like that magician, and they, uh, we have to take special care to make sure our octopus don't crawl out of their exhibits, right? Absolutely. We have to specially design our enclosures so that the animals cannot crawl out. Excellent question. All right. So now we're going to go to Miss Ingram's fourth graders. Hi, everybody. What is your question? Hi. We, we talked a few times in class today, and one of the questions we have are, Tony wants to know, how do they communicate to each other if there was more than one octopus in that aquarium? Oh, so Catherine, they want to know, how do octopus communicate with each other if there's more than one octopus in the enclosure, or just even if they're, if they're out in the wild? Let's talk about that, too. Wow, that is a very good question. Actually, octopuses are solitary animals. They really don't like to interact. But their best form of communication is by that color changing and that texture changing. They can display anger or happiness a little bit by changing their color and their texture. Absolutely. Now, a lot of people associate color change for an octopus with being angry. Now, that is true, but color change is, to, is tied right in to blending in with their environment, but also tied in to just activity. So if they're moving around, they're going to be changing color at that, point, at that time as well. All right, moving on to Ms. Hanlon's class. Uh, what is your question? Oh, uh, make sure that you are unmuting your microphones when you go to answer, ask the question. How many suction cups do octopuses have? Oh, how many suction cups do octopus have, Catherine? Ah, uh, well, octopuses have eight arms and 200 suction cups per arm. All right, so we've got a math question for everybody. <laughs> if they have eight arms and 200 suction cups per arm, how many suction cups do you think that they have total? You guys want to make take a guess? Oh, no, no, no guesses today. <laughs> How many do they have, Catherine? They have 1,600 suction cups. An average of 1,600. That is a lot of taste buds all over those arms. All right. We're going to move along to Miss Pumo's class. Oh, I'm sorry. What? Pause one moment. Okay. Brianna, loud. We are moving to Ms. Kolnig's class. Sorry about that. Ms. Kolnig's class, make sure to unmute your microphone so you can ask your question. Uh, what's the difference between an octopus and a squid? All right, Ms. Kolnig's class, can you repeat your question for us? What is the difference between an octopus and a squid? Oh, what is the difference between an octopus and a squid, Catherine? Ah, well, they are very closely related, but they have slightly different body shapes, as well as squid have extra two arms, which are their feeding tentacles. That's right. So think of squid in the shape of a long torpedo. Now, they have those eight arms, but as Catherine mentioned, two additional arms. Those are their feeder tentacles that they grab onto their, their food with. Now, octopus, rather than having a long tube-like body, they have a round body that is built to, and designed to live on the bottom of the ocean. All right, next class, we have Miss Pumo's class. Okay, Make sure to unmute. I'm unmute, okay. Why do, why do octopuses have so many arms? Oh, why do octopuses have so many arms? Oh, that is a very good question. And they have evolved that way, and it allows them to grab 
onto things, feel underneath cracks and crevices to find their food. So they probably just need all eight of those arms. That's right. They need all those eight arms. Part of the reason is also because they have no shell. They are totally soft, with the exception of that beak that's in their mouth. So having eight arms helps to be able to protect themselves at time B. All right, next question. We are going to be taking a question from Miss Suzette's science class. Uh, Suzette's science class, make sure that you are unmuted before you ask your question. Come on, Anya. What do octopuses do? Well, you got to get them in. What do octopuses eat? Oh, other than crab, what do octopuses like to eat, Catherine? Well, if they can't find their favorite food, they will settle for clams, fish, shrimp sometimes. Those they actually share a lot of the same seafood that we might like to eat as humans. Okay, we have time for two more questions. Okay, sorry, my mistake. We are actually going to be going to Mrs. Andre's class for the next question. Okay, go ahead. Hello. Um, do octopuses see in color? Chicken. Oh, do class. octopuses see in color? Ah, very good question. Actually, no, they do not. They are colorblind. They get to see in black and white. So octopus may see in black and white, but in addition to those chromatophores, they have special skin cells that act as mirrors. So it tells them, they, they pick up colors from their environment or tones, and that tells them what color they need to change to. Excellent question. Okay, we're going to Ingram's fourth graders. What is your question? Uh, Ingram fourth graders, make sure that you unmute before you ask. Sorry. Our students were wondering, they have plenty of food that they eat, but they have a lot of adaptations to protect themselves. So who are their predators? Uh, can you repeat that question? Uh, oh, if they have lots of food to eat, what are their predators? Ah, oh, well, when they are very small, their only predator is fish and any animal that's basically bigger than them. When they get to be this size, their predator is going to be a shark, maybe a marine mammal, and us humans. Absolutely. There are people that eat them. Here locally in Seattle, we've seen seals and sea lions also eating them too. All right, we're going to move along to the next class. We have Miss Hanlon's class. It said in the video that you can only keep octopuses in captivity for one month to one year. Why can't you keep them longer? Uh, I'm not sure of the, the video that you are referring to. Uh, question, the Captain, the question was, um, they had seen in a video that uh, we can only keep octopuses from one month to one year. How come we can't keep them longer than that? Octopuses only live to be about three to five years old. So typically what we do is we keep ours from anywhere to six months to one year. Then we release our animals back out to the wild to finish their life cycle. Now, we want to um, provide our octopus with an opportunity to uh, spend the remainder of their life out in the wild so that they can make more octopuses. All right, we're moving along to Mrs. Kolnig's class. Come on up, hurry up. I can hear you. Um, do they make any sounds? Oh, do octopus make any sounds, Catherine? You know, 
I don't think they, they do. I've never heard any noises from them. <laughs> they don't really have vocal cords like we do. So their their form of communication really is is having to do with those colors and texture changes. <laughs> All right, moving along to Mrs. Pumo's class. Okay, go. Can can octopuses suckers stick onto everything? Ah, can octopuses suction cups stick onto everything? Ah, uh, actually, no, they can't. <laughs> One thing that we use here in the aquarium to keep octopuses from sucking onto things is astroturf. That kind of rusty green grass stuff. But out in the wild, they can pretty much suck onto everything. That's right. So we might line the lid uh, on an octopus enclosure here with that astroturf, which is kind of like plastic grass, and they can't really form that suction on that. It also is kind of pokey, so probably doesn't feel too good. All right, next class, we're going to go to Miss uh, to Suzette's science class. Oh, make sure you unmute before you start talking. How many, how many octopuses have you ever seen? Uh, can you say that question one more time, please? Um, he wants to. He wants to know how many octopuses have you seen? How many octopuses have have you seen? I. Honestly, can't even count anymore. Can you count? Them? Uh, no, actually, I don't think I can. We've had several here in the aquarium over several, probably since we opened in the seventies, and then I've also had the pleasure of seeing them out in the wild. Absolutely. Not really sure how many I've personally seen. Uh, a few out in the wild, but many of them here as well. All right, we have a time to take just a few more questions. And we're going to move on to Mrs. Andre's class. Okay, wait one second. Make sure there's only one person talking at a time. Do octopuses have any other defenses that isn't the suckers? Ah, do octopuses have any other defenses other than their suction cups? They absolutely do. One thing that they do is they release ink into the water to create a smoke screen so that they can swim away. Now, that ink brings us right back to that topic of them being magicians of the ocean. That ink can cause a distraction and hide where that animal is going or blending in, and it could be right in front of the animal that's trying to attack them. Now, that ink is also not just a distraction cloud. It actually has a gritty texture, much like sand, and it can be irritating for the animal's eyes. All right, moving on to Ingram's fourth graders. Hi, we have one more question. You talked about how the octopus could change colors. Does um, he or she have a certain number that they can change? Ah, uh, Catherine, uh, they're talking about how the, the octopus has an ability to change colors. Do, is there a number of colors or is there, uh, that they can actually change to? They can go anywhere from white to dark red, as our octopus just changed to, but they aren't able to change to like purple or green or anything like that. I think of their skin as kind of like when you're mixing paint. So you've got white and you've got bright red. You can also have those various shades that are in between uh, that help them to blend in with a huge variety of things in their environment. All right, we have time for one last question. Mrs. Hanlon's class, what, what would you like to know? Why do octopuses live in cold water and can they live in warm water? 
Oh, Catherine, they want to know why do octopuses live in cold water and can they live in warm water? Ah, well, there is species of octopuses throughout the world. So the giant Pacific cannot live in warm waters, but there are other species that do. Absolutely. So in Hawaii, there are, there are octopus that are only found there. There's also one, probably one of the most famous octopus that's found in a warm Australian waters, the blue ringed octopus. All right. It looks like uh, that is all the time we have for our Google Hangout today. But if you guys have any more questions, please make sure to post them to our page for on Google Plus and put them in there, and we will make sure to get back to all of those questions that you have. But without further ado, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today here at the Seattle Aquarium, our giant Pacific octopus enclosure, and thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.